Okay, welcome everybody for joining uh, this presentation, uh, speaking about the, uh, working effectively with interpreters in the mental health setting. Uh, I will wait a couple of minutes and we'll start off right at 11. Thank you for joining. Um, before we get started, please, if you have any questions, use uh, the, uh, the Q&A um, uh, place to, uh, to put your questions in. Uh, I will address, uh, go over all, all your questions and comments at the end of the presentation. It's almost time. Uh, welcome again uh, to this webinar. Uh, I will be speaking about uh, utilizing uh, the interpretation uh, services and how to work effectively uh, with interpreters in the mental health setting. Uh, my name is Mumina Saradar. Uh, I'm the Senior Manager of Wellness at the National Test Service Center. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I have an additional role wh uh, where I uh, work as mental health interpreter, medical interpreter in the past, uh, where uh, combining both experiences into working in the mental health setting and being a bilingual uh, interpreter, uh, interpreting for uh, almost seven years. Um, please feel free to uh, pu put your all your questions and comments in the Q&A section. I will go over uh, at the end of the, the presentation. Uh, this, is to, this is today's agenda. Uh, I will cover language access for mental health care, uh, then go into depth into the modes of interpretation in the mental health setting. It's really important to understand what uh, different type of modes that the interpreters utilize uh, uh, in different circumstances. Uh, what are the best practices for work, working with interpreters? Um, interpreters' code of ethics and standards of practice. Uh, also, the trauma-informed uh, interpreter. Impact of trauma on interpreters. And the last part of the presentation will be addressing uh, the Q and the questions that have uh, you have. Uh, thought of or any comments you want to add uh, or address. Starting off with the uh, importance of uh, language access, uh, it's really important in our work in terms of why we are working with a diverse uh, population, uh, the effectiveness of our treatment uh, uh, and uh, the uh, the the efficiency of uh, the uh, of of meeting uh, the treatment goals will not be achieved without uh, have uh, having very well communication with the uh, with the patient or the uh, or the uh, family uh, of the patient or the client so it's really important in in our work to utilize interpretation services for law for those that don't speak english or have low english proficiency 
uh, and to make sure that uh, we uh, the, um, all the treatment, the assessment tools we use are very well communicated uh, and um, to, to, to the client where removing the um, the language barrier to access to mental health care services. So uh, first it helped build rapport between client and the clinician. And when we work with the therapy, uh, with interpreters that we consider them part of the treatment team, uh, th this is the key uh, to the success of our sessions. Uh, provide higher quality assessment and more ac accurate diagnosis. And we will go over a few examples on how this, uh, this point uh, is very important and, uh, and should be emphasized in our work. Uh, better treatment plans, reduced likelihood of compulsory admission, uh, because uh, it's really important to address this point in terms of uh, having, uh, when the client feel that they are being uh, taken care of, uh, they were, they, uh, they, their voices have been heard by their uh, therapist or the treating team. Uh, it's really important to, to, to focus on this part. Uh, and the last part, the last one is improve adherence to therapy and medication schedules. Uh, without this, uh, without having uh, a very, uh, without building a very well uh, uh, therapeutic team, uh, we won't be able to achieve uh, our goals from therapy uh, or treat or to achieve the treatment goals. Under the Title VI of Civil Rights Acts, no person in the United States shall on the ground of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participating in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity uh, receiving federal finance assistance. So all agencies that really, uh, receive uh, federal funds uh, are obligated to to offer or provide language access uh, services to their clients. Health and social service providers must ensure free language access services to afford people meaningful access to services. So it should be available and should be available for free. So, uh, so all agencies uh, receiving federal funds, all their programs, activities, and benefits must be language accessible. Uh, it's really important uh, to go over th this briefly to the uh, to differentiate between what interpretation is and what translation is. And often people use these words interchangeably, but uh, actually or honestly, they are different. And uh, uh, making sure that we are aware of the difference between the two words. So interpretation conveys meaning of the spoken word from one language to another, so it's all verbally. I hear the message verbally and try and interpret it into the other in one language and interpret it into the other language verbally. While translation conveys meaning from a source language written, it should be text in a text form to equivalent target language uh, text in the other language. So it's all written. So transferring or converting a written text in in one language into editing text into another language. So uh, it's uh, it's preferred not to use trans, uh, to call an interpreter, let me call a translator because interpreters are conveying verbal message to verbal message, while translators convey written uh, statement to a written statement. Why it's important to focus on uh, language access and what does it mean that I'm offering my services in the mother tongue? We often tell our story through language. Narratives may be expressed incompletely uh, in a second language and that's true. But when I narrate the same story in Arabic, uh, it might differ a little bit when I narrate it in other languages I, I speak. We express emotions through language, and that's really important because therapists uh, during uh, evaluations or assessments, when we ask uh, clients about uh, emotions, 
it's really expressed fully and clearly in the mother tongue. So it's pro it provides the, uh, the primary organizing structure for emotional development, love, anger, frustration, fear, and anxiety are all as associated with the caregiver's words, with our caregivers. The first words we heard uh, when uh, we start le learning the language or acquiring the language. Encoded associations of meaning and emotional tone can be lost in translation, and that's true. When uh, uh, myself, when I'm, I work as interpreter, I strive uh, and uh, work hard to the best that I can to convey uh, the the exact words spoken or said by the client to make sure that I'm conveying them uh, as as close as possible to um, to the mother tongue. Translation of emotional experiences often results in fewer details and depth, and uh, and here where we lo we lose or where the meaning uh, lose its uh, its way. Uh, with when uh, the the interpreters or when the therapists are uh, are uh, conducting the the assessments and evaluations, we express values and identity through language. So different values and identities are expressed in different languages, and they can vary. And sometimes the variation might be might be very slight, and sometimes it varies a lot. Uh, separate linguistic systems have different memories and associations. We also build relationships through language. So language influences the therapeutic alliance, shared language, build trust, ease of communication, and shared identity. Bilingual therapists or trained in-person interpreters are cl critical in therapy. So they, uh, they make a, a huge difference. And uh, we we always always strive to train uh, interpreters in the mental health setting to uh, to make them to offer them or the tools and knowledge and skills that can um, build up with their language uh, experience and skills to make them uh, more comfortable uh, and uh, make them more prepared to be part of the. Uh, uh, therapeutic uh, 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 triad, the client, the, the patient, uh, and the therapist. So how can uh, organizations or agencies support interpreters and clinicians? Uh, there are several ways uh, bo uh, both can be supported. Uh, is providing quality training for both for clinicians and for interpreters. They both need training into, in terms of uh, understanding what, what's the role of each of uh, the other party and uh, how they can uh, collaborate to get uh, all together to make sure that they are doing their best uh, uh, to serve their clients. Support the relationship between clinician and interpreters by allowing time before and after sessions for discussion and debriefing. It's really important if you call a, uh, an interpreter to offer some time, uh, if you are able, for debriefing before the, the, in the session and after, and after the session. I will go over some examples uh, shortly. Ensure that interpreters and clinicians feel comfortable asking questions, expressing boundaries, and articulating needs. Invite interpreters and clinicians to utilize and embrace the expertise of the other. So both are very important. And uh, I really uh, emphasize on this that interpreters are not only language machines. And uh, working with them uh, and collaborating with them in the most effective way uh, it helps you as a clinician and uh, helps your clients to, to receive the best service. Provide supervision for clinicians and interpreters to prevent overwork, vicarious trauma, and secondary traumatic stress. Provide opportunities for personal and professional growth and development. So here are a few ways to support interpreters and clinicians. 
Moving forward to developing capacity for uh, language services, uh, although this might apply for uh, agencies or organi organizations and not for small uh, offices or small uh, businesses, but, but it's really important to think of being part uh, uh, of the whole. So pursuing funding opportunities for interpretation services, we often see that, especially for those that are not fund federally funded, uh, they are short of this funding to utilize language services. Uh, make interpretation training for both interpreters and clinicians an institutional priority. Uh, develop and maintain systems for this for supervision for both interpreters and provide means of support with the organization. Uh, we emphasize the, the part of the interpreters because oftentimes they are forgotten uh, and uh, they work in isolation and don't receive this type of supervision that they need that can support their work. Provide systems for monitoring and evaluation of interpretation services. I will now move to uh, forward to uh, give an overview about modes of interpretation in mental health setting, uh, explain uh, each, each one and uh, give an example of when each mode can be used. Uh, for you to understand, for, uh, it's really important for, not only for the interpreters that learn this, uh, these modes, but also for the clinician who are uh, in the, um, uh, in the session uh, are present in the session and want to understand more and also for you to understand this type of uh, modes uh, uh, will be able to uh, uh, will be a useful tool for you uh, to differentiate between a professional interpreter and non-professional interpreters to be able to uh, choose uh, the best language services for your clients. So we do have the consecutive mode, the simultaneous mode, site translation, and summarization. It's important to note that the consecutive, the simultaneous, and site translation are all accepted modes. Summarization is not a mode, but it can be utilized in certain uh, circumstances. The interpreter role during uh, a session, so the interpreter can play four different roles. Uh, the main primary role we, that we understand is being a conduit, uh, so they uh, interpret exactly what has been said from one language to another. But they also play different uh, other roles other than being a, a conduit. So they can uh, play uh, a role of a cultural broker, so when uh, a, a case when an interpreter provides a necessarily cultural framework for understanding the message being interpreted. And there are certain cases where they step out of the interpreting mode and switch to being a cultural broker when there is a cultural issue uh, uh, at, at that time uh, that they need to intervene, explain the cultural issue there uh, in, uh, and uh, get then then um, get get back to their uh, their role as a as a conduit. Sometimes they need to be uh, a clarifier where uh, the interpreter explains terms that have no linguistic equivalent and checks for understanding. This is one case, but there are other cases where even the, when the interpreter themselves are not sure about the message that they heard and they need more clarification. They are asked to, to use their clarification protocol to check with the clinician about the exact meaning, clarify the meaning, or check if they don't, they, um, or check with the therapist or the clinician uh, about more, to, for more explanation if the mental health terminology lacks equivalence in their language or in the language that they are interpreting in. Finally, uh, the interpreter might play an advocate role. They can intervene and speak on behalf of the client for safety purposes. So this is a rare cases, but sometimes interpreters 
uh, have to advocate for the for the client uh, if they find that there is a, a big issue at stance and they need to do something to protect for the client's safety. And of course, when they do all these roles, uh, they have to use their clarification protocol to alert the clinician that when they are intervening uh, at this time, they are not interpreting, but they are serving a role other than being uh, th th their primary role for the uh, safety uh, and uh, the benefit of the client. So now, uh, um, as I'm, I went over the modes of interpretation, the simultaneous inter mode of interpretation, uh, so the, uh, this is a time when the clinician or the speaker is speaking and the interpreter is interpreting at the same time. Uh, so both, both of them are speaking while the interpreter lacks uh, a few words behind the clinician, where we hear sometimes, uh, sometimes simultaneous is used in uh, conferences, but it might be utilized in the mental health setting uh, in this uh, uh, in this setting, in these events that we will go over. So when, they two, when two clinicians are discussing the client's situation, but do not directly address the client, this might happen in health hospitals or a setting where there are uh, multiple people are speaking at the same time, the interpreter is present and the client is there, but uh, it's not being addressed. The interpreter can use the simultaneous interpretation to let the client understand what's going on. It might be used in the case of mental health emergency. Yes, where there is no time, uh, the, in, the message has to be conveyed, conveyed so quickly, although it won't be so accurate like the consecutive mode, but uh, it will be helpful at least at this point for where the, uh, the, the interpreter assess the case and use this mode to make sure that the client is understanding or getting, or maybe not the client, the other where uh, they, let's say it's an, in an emergency case, the client is disoriented, confused, speaking without quickly, uh, so uh, so fast without without stopping. The interpreter at this moment has to uh, switch to the simultaneous mode. So when time is short, I need to transmit the information quickly as quickly as possible. When clients have highly charged emotions and keep talking without pause, this happened in an incidence where. Uh, let's say a client is seeing a therapist for a couple sessions and they are they just close up without saying any word and all of a sudden in one session the client open up and starts speaking and speaking uh, while they are very emotional so this time the interpreter should not um uh, should not um ask the client to stop or speak uh, in uh, one or two sentences, the best way to address here, and if you are utilizing the same interpreter who, who has been with the client from the beginning, uh, here where you will find it's very useful and helpful to have the same interpreter and where the interpreter is fully aware of the case uh, to change their mode, switch the mode, to let the, the, uh, the clinician uh, get, capture uh, all the uh, small uh, things that they need to. So simultaneous interpreting can work well in this situation because speakers do not have to stop and interrupt their conversation to wait for the interpreter. This is very important. It's it's really important not to uh, uh, stop or in, uh, intervene uh, or, or stop the client from speaking, uh, even they are may maybe emotionally disoriented. I spoke about, or we spoke about the summarization that it's not a mode, but sometimes it's allowed. So these are some cases where we can go over where summarization can be utilized by an interpreter. Uh, in a chaotic environment during an emergency with multiple parties present. So it's really hard to imagine how the interpreter would be able to manage all this. So imagine a very uh, critical or emer emergency 
uh, in a scenario where if, uh, a lot of people speaking, the client is disoriented, uh, speaking non-stop. So this is a case where the interpreter can use the summarization. So the client may, or the client speaks rapidly or incoherently and will not pause to interpret. The client is recounting such a painful experience that uh, that an interruption by the interpreter might be distressing and damage the flow. Or there are multiple parties present speaking with, between themselves. Of course, uh, uh, professional interpreters are trained uh, when they use this mode, before they get into the summarization mode, uh, they have to use the clarification protocol, allow uh, all parties, alert all parties to, to know that the interpreter has now entered the mode of summarization and I will alert you when, uh, when I stop uh, and resume back to consecutive mode. Uh, this um, uh, alert all parties that at least they will be able to understand briefly what's going on, although it's not very accurate, but uh, when uh, things settle back to normal, uh, the interpreter will resume back to the consecutive mode, with it, which is the preferred mode of interpretation, and it's the most accurate uh, way to convey uh, the message or the, uh, the communication. I'll move now to the next uh, se section to uh, offer some of the best practices for working with interpreters. Going over the uh, uh, um, clinician or provider interpreter diet, uh, things that are preferred to be done pre-session, uh, during the session, after the session, uh, the interpreters as cultural brokers, and the clarification protocol. So the why it's important to build the uh, the clinician interpreter diet, uh, and this what make the uh, the mental health uh, setting is very unique and it's it's different from other setting. Uh, from the legal, from the medical, where the interpreter's role is uh, is just conveying the message. Uh, they can't be, uh, we can't consider their role as important as a mental, the mental health interpreter. Uh, and I, uh, we will, we, and we will go over some of the uh, the things that makes this uh, relationship very important. So the. The partnership between the mental health pro provider and the interpreter is in essential. Uh, both can contribute to the therapeutic process. Uh, both hear the trauma presented by the client and work as a team to promote healing. Uh, both debrief, assess the situation and consult on possible outcomes. Both bring unique skills. Why the uh, provider bring the clinical expertise and experience, the interpreter bring the language, skills, and cultural lens uh, to understand the client's experience. Uh, they, so both of them are working in collaboration, provide the client with the best pra practice um, outcomes. Uh, we all understand um, or uh, the importance of bu building the therapeutic alliance. So without working with trained and uh, professional interpreters, we will not be able to build this therapeutic alliance and gain trust with our clients without building this uh, strong relationship, uh, therapeutic relationship with the, uh, with the interpreters that we are working with. So here are a few uh, things that can be done uh, pre-session. So let's say you will be seeing um, a client that uh, uh, the uh, English language is not their uh, first language and you need to uh, call uh, an interpreter uh, for the session. So it's really important to, do, to um, take these steps before the session to make sure that 
you are um yeah you are providing the best uh, services to your client. So brief the interpreter prior to the session, whether it's uh, it's an evaluation, assessment, or whether you will start doing um, a part of any treatment. Brief the interpreter prior to the session, uh, giving them, uh, 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 here I don't mean like going into depth about uh, making sure that you are keeping all this information confidential, but giving the, give them an overview about the important things that they need to know before the session. This will help them get prepared. And all also interpreters are HIPAA trained. Uh, they keep all this information confidential, but make sure that you are offering the best you can of this information for them to help them prepare. Review relevant terms or documents. So if you have documents ahead of time, if possible, it, it, it will be preferred and a great uh, idea to share these documents. If not, just give an overview about uh, special terminology that you might come across. Provide documents ahead of time if possible. Uh, review safety concerns and pre-arranged signals. So uh, depending on the case that you are seeing, uh, make sure that you check with the interpreter if they have any pre-arranged signals. Uh, so these signals help them to take a break if the uh, things get too emotional, or maybe the interpreter is hearing the trauma, a trauma of a client that they went the same uh, the same experience. It's really important to check be before the session whether they um, they have these signs. Let's say getting a glass of water or checking something. So they, they, they mo the most common one is uh, getting a glass of water where uh, if the interpreter told you that they need to take a water break, this means that uh, they need to take uh, some emotional break from what they are hearing or seeing or so. So it's important to check this with them. Check with them the uh, cultural aspects, uh, if they have any uh, things that you might you might uh, uh, be interested in learning about this specific culture. Check with them if they have any specifics um, to avoid possible misunderstanding. Sometimes checking about cultural nor norms, uh, differences in legal or health, health systems. Uh, and many times in, uh, in many countries, uh, the services, uh, they don't have these the services offered here in the United States. And they lack this terminology about uh, the differences between when I say a case manager, a social worker, a therapist, a, psych a psychiatrist, a psychologist. What does this mean? Art therapist, music therapist. It's really important to make sure that uh, the client or the interpreter have their own time to explain the difference. Identify dialects. Uh, we can... Uh, many languages have different dialects and uh, checking with the interpreter if they speak the same dialect before. Uh, so if you, uh, for example, uh, an interpreter speaking Arabic, it doesn't mean that he can interpret for all Arabic client, Arabic speaking clients, because African Arabic is different from uh, Levantine or Middle Eastern Arabic. Make sure that the interpreter is aware of it. And I, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure this applies to all languages where uh, they have different dialects. Um, during during this session, now moving after doing all these steps before the session, uh, here are a few things that would be important to go over. Uh, offer time for introductions, offer time for the interpreter to say their uh, beginning introduction that they set the rules where they have uh, time uh, to 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 uh, inform the interpreter to inform the client and you of their uh, their boundaries uh, of course in the if you are working with an ongoing assignment the interpreter will be the introduction will be said just once at the beginning of the first session because after that all the parties will be uh, Will be aware and uh, will they are uh, about what to expect during the, the session. Discuss confidentiality. 
it's because it's not the norm in many countries and many working and agency that serve immigrants and refugees we face a lot of these issues where you have to uh, reassure them of this confidentiality uh, make sure that you check for understanding and don't depend on the cues like nodding or uh, nodding head or maybe uh, um, ma making any cues. Uh, make sure that you check for understanding verbally and not depend on the uh, the general uh, uh, themes that we uh, we know that maybe head nodding head means uh, yes or uh, very well understood, but it turns out to be not. During the session also use the first person while you are speaking with the, uh, while you, address, you are addressing the client, speak directly to the client, don't address the interpreter, uh, address your client, avoid jargons and acronyms, explain related meaning, it's, Again, this is very important. Many languages lack the uh, equivalent linguistic meaning and needs to be explained. A lot of mental health terminology. Uh, I have a lot of examples where, uh, and we I shared with uh, many interpreters that this this is very important for the therapy for the clinicians, uh, our therapists or providers, to explain what 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 it means. Speak if you, uh, you you are the speaker and it's a, a normal session. Uh, speak at a slower space. Pause between phrases, statements. Allow the interpreter to interpret accurately and precisely. Uh, it's very important uh, not not to ask interpreters to read instructions or written documents unless they are trained to do so. And many interpreters here are are not trained to do sight translation or. Uh, or translate from, from a written document. Uh, instead, uh, read or paraphrase or explain what's in there and let uh, allow time for interpretation. Uh, don't ask the interpreter to provide physical assistance to the client. So their, their role is bound by verbal interpretation. Uh, they can't uh, read, uh, uh, especially if you have documents, consent forms, they can't, uh, uh, just you can't hand these consent forms to the interpreter and uh, ask them to fill it with the or to read it to the client and help them sign it. Please do it your do this yourself because they are not uh, they are uh, they are not trained to do it unless they have both cert they are both certified in verbal interpretation and translation. Pay attention to non-verbal language. Uh, many high context cultures often communicate using gest gestures, body language, voice inflection, and facial expressions. Uh, so um, it, it, we, we, at our agency, we may, many times we, we, uh, we pay attention to this and we have many examples where uh, catching the, the clues facial expressions, uh, body language, it's important uh, for high, high context cultures. And many uh, and high culture clients that come from high context cultures, they don't come to you directly or communicate directly. They use different ways of conveying the message because they think that if they say it straight to, straight to your, your face, they will hurt you, even you are the, their, their clinician or their service provider. So make sure that you are not missing this point. After session, uh, debriefing is very important. So uh, debrief the interpreter to flag any problems. Uh, check with the interpreter if they felt that there are times they cannot accurately interpret. Uh, it's worth asking, checking with them if they felt that uh, the session went very well, if they felt that there is something that occurred during the session and they didn't find a time to check with you, not to, to make sure that they are not interrupting the session. Uh, check if there is any misunderstanding that might have occurred and 
check for suggestions for future sessions. And this also will give you the, um, the opportunity, maybe uh, if you find that they throughout this session that the interpreter did not serve, uh, the um, uh, what, uh, the way that you you expected for, uh, from them, you can just change uh, the interpreter next time and work with or work with a different interpreter. It also serves for them for, to debrief if they felt that they um, they are so stressed or they are, there are times that they felt that uh, something went wrong. So after session debriefing after session is important. These times where the interpreter serve as a cultural broker, so they, here they step back from their role as a language conduit and uh, clarify any cultural misunderstanding. Uh, they have to use the clarification protocol prior to intervention. Uh, the cultural explanation should be said in English and other language. So I, uh, I don't want to um, get uh, more in details, but just for you to uh, if you have worked with an interpreter that has ever used the culture, uh, the clarification protocol, so the interpreter will will just say, uh, "Interpreter needs clarification," and will say it in another in the other language. So, uh, saying this statement will alert all parties that the interpreter is speaking on their behalf, and they are not interpreting at this time. So this, the clarification protocol is utilized to correct, to ex explain correct conduct and procedures followed in formal situations. So anytime the interpreter needs to intervene, ask for clarification or reframing a culturally sensitive question or uh, check for any misunderstanding, they use the clarification protocol. Sometimes reframing examples of reframing a culturally sensitive question, or or maybe sometimes it's uh, to avoid uh, re-traumatizing the client, or they might think, I checked with uh, many staff some, uh, that uh, using the RH15 uh, tool, sometimes the interpreters need to ask the questions in a different way to avoid re-traumatizing or reframing it just to make it less sensitive uh, in certain cases. Uh, clarify the role when they're asked to function outside of their school. Indicate that they cannot translate written documents unless they are trained and certified. Explain that they will not be assisted with patient care. So the, here are a few examples of where interpreters can use the clarification protocol. These are the interpreter code of ethics. So the all interpreters, all trained interpre interpreters abide by confidentiality, accuracy, professionalism, impartiality, cultural awareness, professional development, and advocacy. Societal stigma regarding mental Illness, especially within uh, immigrants and refugee communities, can be a serious concern for clients. And many, many times they refuse um, access to mental health care services due to the fear of stigma, fear of, say, uh, the many, uh, many th th uh, think, think la la that they are crazy or they are not competent to take care of themselves or their families. So this adds up to the all the to the stigma related to uh, utilizing mental uh, mental health services. Uh, um, some of them uh, fear that engaging in therapy or psychiatric treatment, or uh, receiving diagnosis, or if they are being hospitalized, uh, they would je jeopardize their immigration proceedings or asylum applications. So, so this also is as a uh, another com complex layer of uh, for immigrants and refugees to access mental health services. Uh, even though the, um, all service providers are trained on HIPAA, including the interpreters, it's important to uh, reiterate it and emphasize uh, when you if you feel the, that your, your clients uh, 
fear to share or or to engage uh, or seeking these services due to confidentiality. Here are, I brought a few examples of accuracy related issues that sometimes come up and uh, requires uh, uh, to pay attention, paying attention from both the interpreter and the uh, clinician. Uh, so uh, om omission, a message is partially or completed, completely deleted. Addition, where information is included that the speaker did not say. Uh, substitution, when one concept is replaced with another concept. So these are some errors re related to accuracy that might be uh, 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 might happen or uh, might, where interpreters don't pay attention to this during the decisions. So here is an example. A clinician is asking the client, do you hear, do you hear voices? So it was in the interpreter interpreted it, do you hear noises? So voice and noise are the same words in Chinese. So and the client said, yes, I hear some noises all the time. I live on a busy street. So in these examples give us where accuracy might, uh, might be an issue uh, uh, during uh, interpretation and uh, if you hear the uh, your client is answering uh, a que the your question uh, or giving a weird question that's not related to the question, here might be an accuracy related issue, and probably it's maybe due to lack of equivalency or uh, the the interpreter did not use or did not check for more explanation if they don't have this or not trained anyway. Uh, distortion of meaning, the meaning of the message is misrepresented. Here, here is another example. Are you allergic to any medication? So they, it was interpreted, do Western drugs makes you vomit? So the client said no. So uh, another one, lack of familiarity with mental health terminology. The interpreter's lack of understanding of mental health concepts interferes with the clinician's process of assessment. Another example, what kind of mood have you been in recently? The interpreter interpreted it, how have you been feeling? And the client said, I have a headache all the time. So this gives us a few examples of how we can capture uh, accuracy related issues during uh, sessions and how to address it, uh, how to uh, to prepare uh, where if you have time to debrief after the, the session with the interpreter to make sure that uh, uh, to resolve this type of accuracy related issues. Equivalency issues. Um, Many times the inability to interpret idioms or saying. So non-literal saying or concepts com commonly used in one language are not able to translate it to another. Uh, this is another example of a clinician. What does the phrase a rolling stone gathers no moss mean to you? The interpreter, what does it mean to you when you hear that a stone is rolling and no grass is growing on it? So the client is unsure how to answer the clinician's questions due to the confusion how stones and grass relate uh, to her men to his or her mental health. So in this case, uh, the interpreter can use the clarification protocol uh, and um, make sure that they are not using some idiom idioms that are so hard or difficult to explain to find an alternative way to ask to assist the client, uh, um, making sure that uh, the language barrier is not interfering in this case. The last one is the advocacy. There are times when interpreters might step out of their role as communication facilitators to advocate on behalf of the client. And when they serve on behalf of the client, they, they go beyond transmitting the message. There are certain times when they need to do this. Culturally responsive services. 
are services that implement policies and practices to promote understanding and appreciation of cultural differences and similarities and foster the development of interpersonal skills that allow providers to work effectively with diverse individuals while at the same time avoiding stereotypes and bias. What it means to, uh, to utilize the services of a trauma-informed interpreter. So these uh, in tra trained interpreters, interpreters trained in, tra in trauma understand trauma very well, support the client's safety, choice, and empowerment, be aware of the impact of vicarious trauma and ways to prevent it, provide social, cultural, linguistically responsive services that do not re-traumatize the client. And sometimes re-traumatizing varies by cultures. And that's a weird thing, but sometimes, yeah, we might not be aware that we are using a phrase or we are asking the, uh, the type of question that is re-traumatizing. It might not be re-traumatizing in my own culture, my language, but it might be re-traumatizing in the client's culture. Moving to unconscious bias. Bias is a personal attitude or perspective that is uh, personal attitude or perspective that is not fair or impartial viewpoint that you take consciously or unconsciously. Bias can affect our decision making without our knowledge. Uh, it's a human nature, um, unfortunately. And if we do not re-evaluate re ourselves or reassess or commit ourselves, ourselves, it might uh, affect our work. Uh, implicit bias can be both even either a preference or an aversion toward a certain groups of people. Unconsciously, we do this many times unconsciously. The, uh, and we, we occur it via stereotypes, media, or other sources of knowledge. So uh, this might affect the interpreter or, or the clinician. To avoid this in our work as clinicians or interpreters, avoiding making assumptions about, about the client's culture. Um, be careful about the assumption that the, in, in, that the interpreter is an expert in the client's culture. We don't want, want to fall uh, into this mistake, thinking that the client is speaking the same culture, uh, the same language as the client, so they should be an expert. So no one is the cultural expert except the client. Make sure that the uh, the interpret you and the interpreter you as a provider and the interpreter are aware of this, and not to make any assumptions on behalf of the client. Let clients speak for themselves. Make their own decisions in the presence of effective cultural mediation. This uh, brings us to cultural humility. I know. Uh, many times we hear it, many times we go over it as clinicians or service providers, but it's important to bring it in here. It's a li lifelong commitment to self-evaluation, self-critique, and a desire to fix power imbalances, basic cultural understanding and willingness to learn by both the provider and the interpreter. Uh, it's really imperative in effectively serving culturally diverse population. Cultural humility is essential for both the provider and the interpreter to let go of being the expert and be open to understanding the client's own cultural understanding of his or her illness. During, um, during therapy, there are, we encountered a lot of co different cultures. The Western models of psychotherapy where our clients are not uh, exposed to. The client's traditional healing practices, understanding them or not understanding them, uh, making sure that we are capturing them uh, the way they are, they are conveyed is very important. That can guide our diagnosis uh, and treatment plan. Uh, the culture of the organization that is providing the services and we have the client's culture, the interpreter's culture, and the provider's culture. So, so different cultures that are come uh, come uh, into play uh, during the sessions that we want to 
pay attention to it, to each. Some of the cultures influence uh, that have any influence in therapy, gender of the interpreter. Sometimes gender gender preference, same gender interpreter, especially during sens sensitive encounters. Cultural expectations of the interpreter. Some interpreters feel that their communities expect them not only to interpret for the client, but also assist the client uh, in any possible way. So the, here are some of the issues that might come up or some of the things that we have to put in mind while uh, reserving or, or while working with interpreters. Strong language. In, so, uh, in some cultures, uh, some interpreters will be unwilling to interpret coarse or sexual language, including uh, terms for intimate body parts. So this leads them sometimes to omit or part of the message or change sometimes the, um, the meaning because they are not comfortable interpreting strong language. Sensitive topics. Culturally, sometimes they feel uncomfortable, tend to omit parts of the message. Cultural assumptions can also influence the interpreter to begin filtering or summarizing the message. So paying attention to this during the session it will, be, it will help you to make sure that the interpreter are not being influenced by their own, influenced by their own culture. And confidentiality concerns, in smaller communities, some clients fear that the interpreter might breach confidentiality. Now moving to discuss the impact of trauma on interpreters, why they are impacted by trauma more than other providers, the four steps of interpretation they went through, importance of debriefing, and finally, supervision. So this would be the last part uh, of uh, the, uh, the presentation. Most interpreters might, may like the training that help them process uh, stressful and traumatic encounters. Adding to this, skilled interpreters succeed not only in conveying their emotions or personal opinions. This means that be the better they, they, they perform during the session, the easier the provider forget that they are humans and not just bilingual language machine. Interpreters use the first person. Psychologically, it means that the interpreter can start to feel as if the traumatic content that she or he is interpreting happened to him or her. So these are important points to, um, to consider. These are reasons why we have to pay attention to why uh, the impact of trauma on interpreters and uh, uh, thinking of ways of how to uh, assist the interpreters in, in terms of helping them getting over this. So here are the four steps of interpretation. Anytime the interpreter hears a message, uh, the, the first step is listening. Listening to understand what's being said. The second step is analyzing the message followed by converting the message from the source language to the target language. And the fourth step is delivering the message. So what does this mean? It means that the interpreter is the only person in the room who is cognitively processing the traumatic content at least four times for each statement made. So imagine this. The client is just saying it once. The, inter the, uh, the provider is hearing it once, but the interpreter is processing it four times, given the, uh, the process following the four steps of interpretation. So the, to, uh, to, to make sure that we are helping the interpreters process this trauma uh, during uh, um, while working with them, it's it's important to have a debriefing process after the uh, after each session. It doesn't have to doesn't have to be a long session. It could be five to ten minutes, five minutes, just to make sure that the the interpreter uh, 
debrief you as if you you are not their therapist you are not offering therapy for them but having this in place will give them a tool to help them manage the stressful or the impact of the trauma that they heard so it's an important part of the interpreter's self-care could be available it couldn't be available for freelance interpreters but you if you were in a position that can uh, that you have this, this option or you have the uh, the control to offer this option for the interpreter please do so uh, if you have staff interpreters or bilingual employees who interpret, educate your workplace about the need to include interpreters in debriefing. Therapists also can guide interpreters to address the immediate psychological reaction to the trauma for which they have interpreted. Again, this is not therapy. You are not offering therapy to the, the interpreter, but just debriefing for five minutes, for a few minutes will help the interpreter uh, give them a tool just to uh, release some of the stress or the trauma that they have been exposed to during this decisions. Finally, supervision uh, is a recognized me means of professional support and development in uh, many professions. It can reduce occupational stress and burnout Supervision is central to the process of learning and to the expansion of the scope of practice and should be seen as a means of encouraging self-assessment and analytical and reflective skills. We all as uh, uh, clinicians, therapists, or mental health providers, we do have this supervision in place, but we encourage you to have this uh, tool for your interpreters. Uh, at our agency, we... Uh, we offer this tool for our staff interpreters, but it will be helpful if the other agencies offer it as well for the interpreters. I came to the, this is the end of my presentation today. Thank you so much for uh, joining me. I will stop sharing my screen and check to see if there are questions or if you have any comments before ending the session. I can't see any open questions here. I, um, I just wanna take a moment to thank you all for joining me today in the uh, in this presentation, explaining or offering some of some tips on how to work effectively with interpreters uh, in the mental health setting. Thank you all, and uh, enjoy the rest of your sessions for today. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day.